Who is it? Which one? Well, you'll see. This guitar is on my shirt. You have to guess. Whether you think so or not, I'm gonna turn the distortion off or the overdrive. Okay, I'm not gonna do a long video. I'm gonna try not to, but here's my shirt. Someone sent this to me, so there is. Okay, Concord V and this. This is this is this. This is as close as you can possibly get to the one he's play he played on the Diary Tour. Everything I do is Diary of Madman, because that's when he had his sound. He had found his sound. If they would, they have it. They have these tapes where he's doing this incredible, huge stereo guitar stuff, but it never makes it onto a CD, and I don't know why. But you know why? Because most of the shows, and I believe me, I saw enough Ozzy shows. Ozzy is shit. He is crap. He's beep. I shouldn't cuss. But that's the problem. Is they can't find a show where Ozzy isn't so piss drunk that they can't, you know, arrange it so he sounds okay and use some sort of, you know, pitch tuning device to... Because if you listen to that one that they did with Brad Gillis, the live one, not the Sabbath... Not the well, even on the uh, speak to speak of the devil, but the video speak of the devil, where it's live and they do the Aussie songs. His voice is going through a pitch corrector, and uh, it's ridiculous. He sounds like he's singing through a synthesizer. He sucks. Aussie sucks. I don't like him. I used to. I actually, I, I kind of felt sorry for him because he was such a twit and. Uh, you know, goofball, but he fit in Sabbath as the singer. And then he got a total break because of him. Him and Bob Daisley writing all of his albums, all like the first six of his solo albums. Bob Daisley wrote all of the music, and he doesn't get credit for it. It's ridiculous. So anyways, I decided I'd bring this out because it sounds good, but uh, something's up with it. Up here. <laughs> 
It's like the theme. It's a very sensitive neck. I mean, it's, you know, it's a set neck, like all Gibson custom Les Pauls are, Les Paul custom. And that's what this is. Whether you want to believe it or not, that's what it is. And it's got brass, because at the end he had brass plates put, uh, Gibson put brass there, and this brass, but he kept these plastic. I was going to put brass, but you know what? It starts sounding too bright, so it's good to get have a little plastic and wood there. Anyways, and, and I don't do Randy Rhodes like everybody else. My name isn't Randy Rhodes. This is a tribute to Randy Rhodes. And I'm not obsessed with him. I do this to keep his name alive because no one else is doing it. And I'm just as enthusiastic about Eddie Van Halen and have all of his guitars too. And Ace Freely. And B Dimebag Daryl. I almost call him Buying Bag Barrel. I don't know who that guy is, but Diamond Daryl. I like that better because it was like Diamond Dave. Diamond Daryl. When I met him the first time, they came down here in the in 88 and I saw him at the whiskey with my friend Ace Steele if you know him you can ask him and we talked to him and I was trying to get him to either leave his band and I would play bass which I ended up doing anyways in my next band because he was that good and he just had a big you know like an out of control Paul Stanley afro going and I knew eventually that something would happen with that but his guitar playing was amazing. Dimebag. So, you know, unfortunately his brother was <laughs> his brother. And he loved his brother. And he wasn't going to leave him behind. And they do make a perfect music. Just like Eddie. Eddie and Alex. Dime and, uh, what's this guy's name now? I can never remember his name either. Diamond, Daryl Abbott, and uh, Gingelbert. I can't remember his name. And he's gone now, too, so whatever. All we got left is the guy that caused it all to go to hell, which is Phil. And he's a great singer, and he was a big part of Pantera making it big. Why am I talking about Pantera? Because he liked Randy. So anyways, the guys that I like, I have all their guitars. I just tend to play a lot of these, a lot of Randy's guitars, or guitars that Randy played, and wear shirts and have bags. Because I want to keep his name out there. It's already starting to be forgotten. I ask guitar players, young guitar players, who's your, oh, they name off all these idiots. And, you know, I'm like, okay, but what about Randy Rhodes? Who? Ozzy Osbourne. Oh, Zach Wilde? No! The guy that started it. The guy with the polka dot V. Crazy Train. Oh, that guy, yeah. yeah dude, look into that guy. That's the guy. He actually set, I mean, there was Eddie Van Halen and there was Randy Rhodes at the beginning of the 80s. You know, because technically Blizzard of Oz was recorded basically in 1979, I think. And the, a year went past before they did the second album. Sharon does this bo bullshit thing in all of her interviews that Diary of a Madman was, re was recorded and released three months after Blizzard. No, it was released in the States three months after Blizzard. So she's trying to keep that lie going that, you know, Bob, Daisley, and Lee were on the first, and then they kicked them out and recorded the second album with uh, Tommy and Rudy. Uh -uh. No way! You can tell it's the same drummer. And I've re I used to read articles how great the new band is, and on the you could tell on the new album that the sound is... Yeah, because they tuned down, and they had toured for an entire year they've been playing together. For a whole year! Then they went back in, recorded Die Room Madman, started to play some of the songs here on this tour when they did a North American short one, and then they were gearing up for the Diary of a Madman, so when that came out in the States, they'd be pushing that in January of 80 when he died, too. So, it's just bull crap. I don't know. I don't like thinking about it. Just think about what cool things he did, how he did it. And, like, you know, when it all happened, I was friggin' freaking, but 
I was too much into myself. What am I going to do? I want to get my own sound. Because that's what he would always say. Develop your own sound. He has got his own sound. His own way of playing. He was not ripping off Eddie. He was showing people he could do it, what Eddie does or anybody else. And more. He was doing the classical thing when Ingwi Malmsteen was still smacking it in the diapers. So... Well, I mean, he was, Ingwi was over here when he was like 20 in 80, what, 3, 82, 83. When I went to see Steeler, because I had ran into Ron Keel, and he was kind of, he was this guy from, you know, back east, and kind of like a cowboy dude, but he was had hair, and he was ready to go, blah, 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 blah. And he got this guy, Rick Fox, which was like my bass player. He looked great, but he could not play, just like Nikki Six. Looks great, can't play. Rick Fox, same thing. My Tony Rydell, same thing. Anyways, so went to see Steeler. They had backing. They had this crazy guitar player from Sweden or whatever, and he's just going. I'm like, holy crap! That's faster than Eddie. It, it seems like. And then it became a speed contest. So I entered the speed contest. I didn't bother with tapping. That's why I still don't do it very well because I, I never did it. Who cares? Anyways, there's a whole, there's a way to do it. You just got to do it right. 